Today's our guest speaker is Dr. Richard Thakre. He's going to talk about steel research in steel city. So the Richard is going to talk about the research done in the Seppel University, what they have done it in the past, what they're doing currently, and what's the future ambition from, um, on the steel research. So it's over to you, Richard. Thank you very much. Let's start at the very beginning and talk about iron and steel making research and, and some work we did uh, some, some time ago looking at trying to improve the efficiency of the iron making process. So this was uh, taking a, an old idea, um, looking at um, a, a proposal that was uh, first uh, came out of Japan in the 1980s, which was to try and reduce, remove phosphorus um, in a different part of the steel making operation. And the reason we looked at this was because it's um, very, very topical, this idea of, of high phosphorus uh, iron ore um, being, being quite scarce now and, and having to rely on, on low, uh, uh, high phosphorus iron ore, sorry. So low phosphorus iron ore being quite scarce, having to rely on low, uh, on high phosphorus iron ore. So uh, anything that we could do to try and remove the problem of phosphorus during the steel making process or iron making process will be quite beneficial because phosphorus is quite a, a problem, quite problematic when it comes to the actual steel making side of things. Um, and, uh, and, and you can see here on the, on, on the right hand side, this, this um, very um, recognizable um, shape of the phosphorus removal curve as a, as a function of oxygen blow time. And in some, uh, depending on, in, in, in some uh, steel making operations, depending on the, the process parameters and the process conditions, you can actually have what we call phosphorus reversion, where the, the, the phosphorus goes back from the slag back into the metal, which is exactly the opposite of, of what you'd like. So understanding a bit more about phosphorus removal, and in some cases trying to put in a, a separate stage in the process. So here we've got the typical um, blast furnace steel making route where we, we make iron in the blast furnace, then we remove sulfur, and then we make steel in, in the boss or the boff plant. Here's uh, the, the proposed route was to try and put a separate dephosphorization step in between uh, the blast furnace and the, the boss plant uh, to try and, and remove or reduce this problem of, of phosphorus later downstream. So here was the PhD premise. We tried to look at um, removal of phosphorus uh, in a particular atmosphere, maybe try and study some of the kinetics the thermodynamics of uh, of, of phosphorus removal uh, under these conditions. A look at the effect of things like atmosphere, lime atmosphere. Did that make a difference to the removal of phosphorus? Metal chemistry, droplet size, and so on and so on. So this was some work done with, done with Tata Steel, looking at uh, choosing uh, different techniques to, to study this particular aspect. And we have a number of different options here. Um, some of them uh, are, are very much um, um, linked to reaction time. Um, some of them uh, require fairly specialized equipment. And what we ended up choosing was were, were two. Uh, one where we dropped um, the, a, a, a droplet through a container of lime um, and, and study the reactions occurring. And the other technique we used was a stationary technique where we um, packed a, uh, a crucible, if you like, with, uh, with lime and, and studied the, the effect of stationary droplet. So two different uh, approaches to the problem to try and understand a bit more about dephosphorization and whether it would in fact be possible at this stage of the process. And in fact, we found that very little removal of phosphorus took place in such a, a short fall time. Uh, and a lot of the parameters what that we were interested in looking at didn't really have an effect um, or, or didn't have the effect that we, we, we thought they might make. So really, we, we, we sort of removed the, um, or disproved, or uh, put it on the back burner, this idea of, of the possible uh, extensive removal of phosphorization. Um, but what this study did was it allowed us to know a bit more about droplet steel making reactions. And it tied in really nicely with a similar study that was going on at the same time with Stephen Spooner, uh, who was looking at removal of phosphorus a bit further down downstream. So again, a nice uh, tie-in study um, that allowed us to know a bit more about potential phosphorus removal in iron making 
and phosphorus removal in steel making. Some work that was done uh, a little bit after that was work done with Sheffield Forge Masters uh, with, with my colleague at the time, Brad Wynn and uh, Jesus Talamantis Silva at Forge Masters and Steve Phillips, done by a PhD student, Faris Karuni. Uh, and he looked at developing some CFD models to look at um, the removal of hydrogen in a vacuum arc degasser. So this is a, an integral part of Sheffield Forge Masters steel making route. Um, and they were interested to know if we could improve the efficiency of that hydrogen removal. So the idea was to try and identify what the optimum conditions might be for, for removal of hydrogen in, in, in our vacuum um, arc degasser. And of course, the first stage will be to, to validate and develop, um, input the model, compare it with industrial data. And you can see here that um, the model predictions quite nicely uh, match with uh, some of the uh, measurements taken, um, historical measurements taken from Forge Masters. So we had a fair, fair high confidence that, that the model was, uh, was, was, was certainly on the right lines. And then once that had been established, we could look at varying the design conditions. So in this case, we, we looked at uh, changing the number of plugs where we inject um, the, the gases, um, varying the ladle aspect ratio, which uh, is, is easier said than done, but um, certainly would be something that Sheffield Forge Masters would, would like to know in the future. And also the positions of the plug. And tested these against the time taken to effectively remove hydrogen from five parts per million down to 1.5 parts per million. And you can see here the uh, differences in the uh, use of, in this case, is one, two or three uh, injector plugs and the, um, the uh, effect of that on the um, removal of hydrogen after 20 minutes. So we've got different number of plugs and different configurations of plugs. And it was quite fairly um, established quite early on that um, using double and triple plug ladles reduces the degassing time uh, for a 100 ton melt of molten steel by about anywhere between 20 and 35 percent compared to the current operating procedures, which were using one um, plug. And in summary, once the model had been established and we could look at the different process conditions, we saw that multiple plugs are preferable. Um, there was an effect on the, on, the, on, the, on the aspect ratio of the ladle. So again, although it's not something that, that, that was immediately um, implementable, it was something that was very useful for Forge Masters going forward. And that the, the position of the plug was, was optimal as well. Um, that way you, you, you would remove dead zones in, 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 in the degasser and you'd improve the efficiency and speed of the degassing process. So a nice bit of work there um, that could be applied to a number of other secondary steelmaking processes, not just uh, vacuum arc degassing and not just the removal of hydrogen either, but the removal of things like nitrogen uh, and also decarburization too. Quite a lot of work we've done over the past five or ten years or so has been looking at steel cleanness. So this idea of understanding more about inclusions, uh, how they form, what their effect is, particularly their effect on mechanical properties. And in our case, focusing on the effect of deformation in some cases on inclusion numbers and size uh, and, and type. And this has ranged from um, um, looking at the uh, effect of steel making process route, um, looking at the um, effects of thermomechanical processing, looking at the position in the continuous cast bloom of inclusions. So a number of different studies, um, both um, uh, larger and, and smaller projects in this particular field, they ranging from very, very simple um, undergraduate projects that allow us to track the evolution of inclusions through the secondary steelmaking route. So we've got um, um, before calcium injection in secondary steelmaking, we've got post calcium injection, we've got post degassing, and then we've got some values just before we go into the tonne and into, into the continuous caster. And we can measure the size, the frequency, the composition of the inclusions, 
uh, in each of these uh, different scenarios and see how the, the number and size evolve. Now, hopefully you'd see the number of inclusions drop nicely, but in this case we saw an increase and we had to try and understand why we were getting that increase in a particular part of the steelmaking operation. So that was a, a simple undergraduate project, all the way through to, to slightly more uh, sophisticated analyses, looking at the, um, the effect of position in the bloom. So we took a very large uh, continuous cast bloom and we analysed inclusions in different positions in that bloom to see if um, that had an effect on the number and type of inclusions that we might see um, and carried out some fairly simple analysis uh, that could uh, look at the average diameter of inclusions as a function of depth from the surface of the bloom and see how that varied um, and you can see that, um, that there was some effect of, of position in the bloom uh, and uh, number of inclusions. As you'd probably expect, of course, the solidification conditions will be different from the outside to the inside. Then we looked at the effect of deformation on those inclusion types. So the top chart here is looking at the proportion of inclusion types in the cast steel. And having carried out some Glebal testing at Tata Steel, we were able to then try and measure the proportion of inclusion types in the deformed position. So again, you can see the, the, the differences. And again, you might expect differences. Deformation is going to have an effect. It's going to break up some of these inclusions. Uh, but it's quite interesting just to characterize those and, and prove the effect of deformation on, uh, on inclusion population. We then took that one stage further and some work that, um, that was done in conjunction with the mechanical engineering department at Sheffield to try and observe these inclusions during tensile testing. So some um, digital image correlation work um, looking at, um, and micro tensile testing, looking at um, the effect of um, tensile testing um, on inclusion behavior um, and, and trying to, again, understand more about um, whether uh, some inclusions are more harmful in this case uh, or some inclusions um, break up and become less of a problem uh, as you go further downstream to process. We also did a PhD looking at uh, the effect of deoxidation route on inclusion population. Uh, and this ended up really as a, as a nice sort of comparison of different inclusion analysis techniques. There are standard inclusion analysis techniques. Um, there are a, a choice of techniques to choose from, uh, all with their with their advantages and disadvantages. So it, as a sort of secondary uh, effect of this PhD, it was a, a nice comparison of different inclusion analysis techniques. So we started off again by, by carrying out some work to look at the distribution of inclusions by position in the continuous casting bloom. Uh, so number of inclusions, average size of inclusions, uh, aspect ratio, area of inclusions, and so on, all fairly standard uh, treatment. But again, interesting to note um, how uh, the, the position in the bloom um, influences the, the inclusion population. But then the focus of this research really was to carry out the effect of deoxidation route. So when it comes to removal of oxygen in liquid steel, we have a number of, uh, of choices. Uh, one is to add, conventional one really, is to add deoxidizers like aluminium, uh, manganese or silicon. And in this case, we, we looked at two different oxidation routes. We looked at using aluminium only in the blue, and we looked at uh, a route that used aluminium and silicon to, to deoxidize. And again, to try and understand more about the effect, there was some um, thinking from the company that there was, there was a, a difference in the behavior of inclusions depending on the deoxidation route. So some of the, 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 the steel was more dirty if you used a particular deoxidation route. And they were asking us to investigate a little bit more about that. And again, we, we took the opportunity as well to uh, do a similar study to before, where we looked at the as cast inclusion population and compared that to the deformed inclusion population. So after deformation, in this case, forging. This was a, a forging steel for the oil and gas industry. Um, and again, looking at the, the effect of, uh, of uh, deoxidation route and looking at the effect of deformation on the number, the average area and the average size of inclusions. And you can see uh, um, 
uh, again, uh, an effect of defamation uh, on, uh, on, on the average size. Uh, whether that's a significant effect uh, remains to be remains to be seen, remains to be discussed. But certainly, some effect of uh, of defamation on inclusion population. And again, looking at the the, the type of uh, of inclusion, so manganese sulfide is, as you might expect, very predominant um, in in silicon aluminium killed steels, but a slightly different mixture of uh, of inclusions in the aluminium killed, and tend to be smaller inclusions when you use aluminium to deoxidize rather than silicon aluminium. And we also carried out some really nice work with NPI up in Teesside to characterize these inclusions and end up with these sort of um, ternary projections for each particular case where you could again see nice graphically, nice visually, the, um, the, um, the, the, the number and the, the chemistry of inclusions within a particular deoxidation route and also carried out some fairly simple analysis but quite interesting analysis nonetheless looking at um, statistics of the extreme to try and understand what the likelihood of finding an inclusion of a certain size might be given the data that we collected um, and again this was this was uh, interesting work that um, we didn't have a huge amount of time to explore within the phd but it's nevertheless really important for this type of analysis. Um, it's all very well to measure an inclusion population, but then having that capability to predict what that might mean in practice uh, is, is really quite powerful. So in this particular case, larger number of inclusions uh, in a particular deoxidation route. The aluminium heats were slightly more variable, had a higher proportion of brittle inclusions than silicon aluminium, Brittle inclusions that you might expect to break up during defamation and become slightly less harmful. And there was really no effect of this on mechanical properties, uh, which was good news to the steel company. Um, but quite interesting, we did some uh, impact testing. We did some crack tip opening displacement testing as well. There was really no effect, no significant effect of deoxidation on mechanical properties. But again, it was quite nice to see this, uh, this unintended uh, result of this work was the variability of the methodology used to measure the inclusion populations um, and a sort of trade-off between uh, time and accuracy um, that is, is, is anyone who's looked at inclusions will, will understand very well. The last few years or so we've moved to a slightly different aspect of steelmaking and that's to try and look a bit more about the environmental assessment of steelmaking. And that means carrying out some sort of life cycle assessment or uh, material flow assessment or life cycle inventory assessment to try and quantify some of the environmental uh, aspects of, of iron making and steel making. And the first of these was a few years back where we looked at potential use of biomass and waste plastics as coke replacements in the iron making process. So before the raw ingredients for, uh, for the blast furnace can be put in top of the blast furnace, they're generally sintered together. And we were looking at trying removing some of this very expensive metallurgical coke uh, and very carbon intensive metallurgical coke and replacing it with biomass or waste plastics, carrying out some small scale trials to compare the performance of these alternatives um, and some larger scale trials, uh, some sinter pot trials, again with Tata Steel, to try and look at the yield and porosity and the, things like the combustion efficiency as well. So um, aspects that, that are, are really important when you're trying to assess the, the possibility of, of different alternative materials to metallurgical coke. And then carrying out some simple LCA with various replacement scenarios with, with Tata Steel Environment. So we looked at different biomasses, we looked at oat husks, we looked at rice bran, we looked at um, brewery residue, um, we looked at uh, two different plastics, polypropylene and polystyrene, and we looked at it in different quantities um, from five up to 25% replacement. And we looked at things like the sinter yield compared to coke. We looked at the porosity compared to coke. We looked at the combustion efficiency uh, compared to coke. And we looked at the time above uh, 50, 70 and 90% combustion efficiency. And you can see that some of these um, 
So the 5% oat husk and the 5% rice bran, so very, very small substitutions, tended to show quite uh, promising results in terms of their comparison against coke. Um, but really, it's very difficult to properly assess center yield quality uh, from these very small scale trials. You almost have to go from the small scale lab trials up to the medium scale lab trials, up to the large scale lab trials, up to the plant trials in some of these before you get a really full picture of how these materials might behave uh, in a realistic environment. So it's quite difficult, you know, we're almost only halfway here in this particular case, and there needs to be another layer of larger scale testing that needs to be carried out. But what, was, what we did find was that certainly the plastics didn't perform as well as, as the, the biomass alternatives. So some interesting results, but also identification of some, of some challenges in how to, to scale this up uh, and, uh, and provide some, some, uh, some more useful, relevant data. One aspect we then looked at was this idea of substitution. So this idea of substituting one element with another. Um, and, and, and I guess um, that, that is relatively well understood, but maybe the, the economic and the environmental aspects of substitution are slightly less well understood. So in this particular PhD, again, working with Tata Steel, we looked at different LCA techniques to look at the contribution uh, to various environmental impact categories of a number of advanced high strength automotive steels. And we quickly found that in terms of our LCA requirements, the data didn't exist. So particularly the data for ferro alloys, which are the, the ways in which you add alloying elements in the steel making process. The data just didn't exist or where it did exist, it was quite obviously um, not robust. So we took a bit of a change in direction for this PhD and we said we, what we tried to do was to, to develop data for these different ferro alloys. Uh, and again, that would allow us to understand a bit more about what the effect of substitution might be. So here we've got two steels, one at the top, one at the bottom, uh, different automotive steels. And you can see we've got the individual contribution of alloying additions or ferro alloying additions. So for the top steel, you can see that the biggest contributor is uh, silica manganese, whereas a different grade of steel, um, the, the, the biggest contributor will be electrolytic manganese. So again, depending on what your recipe uh, requires, depending on what your raw materials are, you're going to have a very different effect of your alloying elements and therefore a different uh, environmental impact profile for different grades of steel. And we could sum it up in this particular uh, figure here, where we're looking at seven different advanced high strength steel grades and looking at the additional CO2 per tonne due to the alloying additions. And you can see that some steels, particularly these on the, on the right hand side, have a relatively uh, modest uh, extra effect of their alloying additions. But some of the other uh, grades, of course, with different chemistries, um, have a, a much greater additional CO2 impact. Uh, and that's because of their, their different raw material requirements and their different recipes for steel making. One of the big um, um, research projects over the past uh, three, four years or so has been Sustain. It's a partnership with, uh, with Warwick and Swansea and Sheffield and uh, all the major steel makers in the UK, plus a number, a number of other uh, catapults, for example, and MPI, looking at different challenges um, in terms of steel manufacture, looking at uh, two main themes, uh, carbon neutral iron and steel making and smart steel processing, um, splitting those down into different themes and different tasks. Um, I know you've had uh, talks from, uh, from various people at Swansea on some of these, so I won't dwell too much uh, on this particular diagram. But just to pick out some of these tasks that we're involved in at Sheffield. The first one is easy, is looking at um, integrated steel making to reprocess waste. So it's a sort of follow on of that uh, project that we did to look at alternatives for uh, fossil fuel uh, raw materials in iron making. So this idea of trying to remove some of the coal and coke, the, the fossil fuels, uh, with something else, an alternative material, and measuring the flowability and the analysis and the thermal chemistry, and the, the heat 
um, performance and the combustion efficiency of these potential alternatives. And this is what uh, my colleague Peter Holloman is doing down at Swansea with his team and, and, and Julian Steer, who I believe has given you a talk, Julian from Cardiff, working on uh, analysis and comparing these different raw materials. And carrying out some really nice um, pyrolysis experiments, for example, um, different thermal analysis techniques, looking at things like sub coal, um, plastic and paper mixtures, and identifying what the, 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 the most optimum proportion of, of those blast furnace fossil fuel alternatives might be. But what we're doing at Sheffield, and we've just got a, an NHD project that just started is to try and uh, look at some of those alternatives and carry out some uh, robust life cycle analysis and life cycle assessment of those potential alternatives. So having learned the, some of the lessons from the earlier PhD, we're going to take this forward and hopefully provide information about cost benefits um, and provide more information about the suitability of some of these alternatives that Peter and his team are looking at down at Swansea. So an interesting 18 months ahead. Another sustained package that um, uh, involves uh, uh, my, my good friend Zushi Lee. Uh, I've known Zushi for about 20 years now. Um, we're working together on a, on, a, on a task looking at effective residual elements. So a number of different um, uh, PhDs arising from, from sustain. Um, again, our, our NGD is due to begin next year. Uh, and, and will hopefully complement the work that Zushi and his team at Warwick are carrying out. This is on the, the idea of, of the effects of residuals. So we, we know that there's, there's potential negative effect of residual elements in steel. Here's a list on the left hand side of a number of culprits, copper, tin and antimony, lead, bismuth, so on and so on. And the, 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 the potential negative effect uh, on, uh, on, on steel performance and steel behaviour. There are many ways in which we could potentially remove these, these residual elements. Um, so if they start to build up and they start to become a problem, then there are different ways in which we can remove and maybe dilute some of these residuals. So there are available mechanisms for individual, the removal of individual elements. You can see on the right hand side here, we've got um, the removal of copper, which tends to be the most uh, uh, problematic for them all and the various ways in which we can reduce the residual copper content down from a very unhealthy uh, 0.2 mass percent at the top right, all the way down to a much healthier um, 0.4, 0.5% uh, with different treatments and different um, solutions. Now, some of those solutions, and this is looking at work on removal of tin, some of them are technologically feasible. But I think in, in, in many ways they're impractical. So here is adding um, calcium carbide uh, to remove tin, which, which we know works. But then, of course, you've got a very, very high carbon content in your steel and you've got to try and do something to, to, to solve that problem. There's been some work adding rare earth elements. But again, that, that uh, is it, whether that's um, um, really practical, a really practical solution is another matter. So um, Zushu and, uh, and Claire and, and Stephen Spooner uh, have done some really nice work looking at residual buildup uh, and trying to sort of prove uh, the difference between electric arc furnace steel making, basic oxygen steel making, understand more about the, the way in which these residuals build up um, and putting forward some solutions to, to, to solve that particular problem of buildup. So some really nice work that they've done there, looking at the difference between uh, electric steel making and blast furnace steel making. But one thing that we, we were, we're hoping to look at in this project is the idea of retention. So although the work is focused on residuals like copper and tin and lead and zinc to, a, to an extent, there's also been some work trying to look at other elements uh, like particularly chromium and nickel and molybdenum, very expensive elements. Um, and almost getting to a point where you only need to use them if they're if they're required and where they're not required in the steel uh, not to use them so this idea of retaining the, the, the these elements in in the steel making operation either retaining them in the scrap metal or retaining them in the slag um, because 
again, um, if, if, if they're not needed, then uh, you, you've got a, a situation where you're losing a potential valuable resource and you're also um, uh, having a negative economic effect as well. So this was uh, some ideas that, that we talked about with Tata Steel about 10 years ago, this idea of trying to understand a bit more about what happens to these elements during steelmaking and recycling operations and looking at strategies for trying to keep these metals in the loop. And this work um, is, is, is um, something that uh, has been looked at in particularly in Japan over the past 10 years or so. And the idea is that to, to efficiently use these alloying elements, whether you, you're talking about residuals or, or other elements, then you need some sort of recycling or sorting process that uh, allows us to sort the, easily sort the material on the basis of things like chemistry. But of course, there are problems associated with that. It might be a fairly obvious solution, but there are significant problems associated with that, with the scrap market, the supply chain, the, the cost of some of these technologies, and so on and so forth. But if you can design those strategies to retain some of these elements in steelmaking, then people have uh, done some work to calculate what the, what the gains might be. So the reduction in input, the reduction in greenhouse emissions by retention of some of these elements uh, again, some work done in Japan about six or seven years ago that quite clearly shows that the possible gains you can get if you imp implement uh, this, this uh, an optimum strategy for, for scrap sorting. Again, easier said than done. So some questions to be asked. Um, there's a lack of data. There's, there's a lack of data, published data uh, on, on this topic. And hence, there's some justification for this work that we're doing with Zushi. Some work being done on the environmental impact, as I've shown, some uh, work, really nice work done by Julie Olwood and his team at uh, University of Cambridge, looking at the um, energy requirements for uh, removal of copper. And we've seen some of the environmental impact that Ono and his team did in Japan. And there's also some work done from other industries as well. So here's a, a nice piece of work from the aluminium industry, which looked at different strategies for different aluminium alloys, uh, and again, showing the potential uh, efficiency gains that you can employ if you implement the right strategy. So I think the steel industry has got um, the potential to learn from other industries uh, who are facing similar problems with uh, residuals and uh, other expensive elements. And so our, our NGD project is gonna look at trying to understand more about the environmental impact of some of these scrap sorting strategies uh, that have been talked about and um, and also to look at the the impact of, of these removal um, strategies uh, and retention for alloying elements so that's a project that's going to start in the next uh, three or four months or so student is already in place and again uh, quite an exciting 18 months ahead Related topics that, uh, again, um, uh, we're interested in too are, are, are recovery. So there's lots of work going on at the university on recovery of zinc from steel making operations and also vanadium and titanium. So my colleagues in the chemical engineering department looking at uh, novel, innovative ways of, of, of recovery of those particular elements. Uh, and again, at the same time, carrying out some sort of environmental impact on those recovery mechanisms too. And then the problem of nitrogen um, uh, it's, it's one of these residuals that, that tends to get forgotten about, but uh, uh, nitrogen levels remain an issue for many, many grades and applications. And again, um, a knowledge of, of, of the effect of some of these uh, mitigation techniques and looking at alternatives uh, is something that uh, we'll be interested in over the next few years or so. And finally, sustain another task five, intelligent steelmaking with, uh, with Michael Aringer, Warwick and, and our team at Sheffield. So the idea for task five is to develop some through process models. Um, this idea of creating a digital refinery twin, a digital twin of the, of the steelmaking refinery. That will allow us to optimise for things like process efficiency and reduce waste. But a key part of the development of these process models is an ex assessment of the existing process efficiency. And there's many, many approaches that we could take to try and benchmark existing process efficiency. Some of them have looked at exergy, some of them have looked at resource efficiency, 
Um, there's been some really nice work done by, uh, again, uh, Jonathan Cullen and his team at Cambridge with uh, Tata Steel then at Port Talbot, um, looking at material efficiency for, in this case, um, oxygen steel making, the boss plant, and splitting that boss plant into a number of different discrete uh, entities and looking at the efficiency of those entities and identifying areas where um, where you can make efficiency gains. And I think it was quite successful in, in identifying which parts of the process were working slightly less efficiently than maybe could be the case. So what we're doing in this is working with Liberty Steel, uh, carrying out some comparison of uh, electric art furnace performance, um, carrying out some LCA of products, and also uh, a, a spin-off that we, we didn't uh, envisage at the beginning. But there's a lot of interest among steelmakers in trying to understand a bit more about their, their refractories uh, and the ways in which we can maybe improve the, the efficiency of, of, of use of refractories. Steelmaker material to the success of steelmaking operations. So uh, a bit of a renewed interest in those materials as part of this particular project. So I hope that gives you an idea of, of Sustain and some of the, the, the projects that we're involved in in Sustain and that of course will run for the next uh, five, six, seven years or so. Uh, and I know that Warwick are very heavily involved in a number of the, the, the later tasks in Sustain, looking at um, hydrogen steel making and uh, late product development and so on. Really, really exciting time uh, for Sustain uh, in the UK. I've been working on continuous casting for, for, for many, many years just want to give you a couple of uh, examples of some of the continuous casting projects. Um, most of those projects have looked at development of what we call mould powders. So I was really fortunate, and this was the first time I met Zushi, um, to work with uh, Ken Mills at Imperial College, who, um, who literally wrote the book about mould fluxes. These simple materials that have a really important role to play in continuous casting of steel. Uh, and the quality of your continuous cast product. So what we've been doing for, for a number of years now is, is working in this area here of laboratory based, looking really at the effect of mold powder chemistry on performance and properties and working alongside some plant trials and some of the performance uh, based uh, uh, work that's been uh, done as part of the RFCS projects, for example, again, working with MPI working in this area to try and understand more about these very, very simple materials that have a really important role to play. Because the, the, um, the situation at the mould, um, here, here is a submerged entry nozzle. Uh, on, on, on the left hand side is a continuous casting mould made of copper. You've got a, quite a complicated, well it's not quite, it's a very complicated environment here where you've got liquid steel, You've got uh, molten mold powder, you've got solid mold powder, so on and so on. You've got a very dynamic environment. And what happens here has a very big role to play in the quality of your, the internal quality of your steel, but also the surface quality of your steel too. And of course, you know, you don't want to be introducing problems in the continuous casting operation that are very, very difficult to remove further downstream. So understanding more about this effect of mold powder on surface quality is something that is still really, really topical. It's been looked at for 40 years. We know more about it, but we certainly haven't solved all the problems. So we did some work a few years back looking at the um, effect of mole powder composition, particularly the, the lime alumina ratio, the CA ratio on performance and properties. We also looked at additions of um, titania, zirconia and B203. Try and shed some light on the effect of these how it affects the viscosity and also the interaction, the steel mold powder interaction, uh, all wrapped up in this idea of understanding more about the quality of our continuous cast products. So certainly for some of the, the, the high aluminium steel grades that have been developed at the moment, um, some of the, the newly developed mold powders, uh, I think newly developed, but probably 10, 15 years or so ago, um, they don't tend to work properly in some cases. They tend to crystallize quite easily. They also tend to pick up aluminium from the steel and that affects their viscosity and that affects negatively affects their performance. 
And so sometimes we see quite a, 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 um, a marked decrease in slab surface quality if you don't choose your mold powder correctly. So we carried out some work uh, looking at calculation of crystallinity based on chemical composition using metal graphic determinations, X-ray diffraction measurements, some of the techniques developed by Zushu uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago were used to calculate the crystal crystallinity. We looked at a range of different materials, the different C over A ratios and additions, as I mentioned, of things like zirconia. We did some hot stage microscopy up at MPI. We did some simultaneous thermal analysis to understand more about the, uh, the uh, effects of, of chemistry on the, on, the, on the heating and cooling performance of these powders. And then we carried out some standard viscosity measurements as well. Um, you can't do much more powder work without measuring viscosity or calculating viscosity or estimating viscosity. So we use different techniques from the standard rotating bob viscometer all the way up to some thermodynamic calculations and some empirical models as well. And we also carried out some studies looking at the steel slag interaction. So um, the, the interaction you get with your uh, molten steel and your, 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 your mold powder to try and understand a bit more about what goes on at this, this really important interface. And so we did some work that looked at the um, effect of uh, uh, crystallinity, uh, sorry, effect of C over A ratio on crystallinity. We looked at the effect of CO ratio on viscosity. And you can see here, and again, this is very familiar to anyone who's done any sort of high temperature measurement work in the past. The difference in viscosity from different methods that you use and how to, um, overcome that particular problem, uh, which one do you use, which is the most accurate, um, re a, real, a real challenge and still a real challenge too. We looked at the C over A ratio on the steel slag interaction and the change in things like aluminium content and manganese content as a function of time uh, when the steel is in contact with the slag. And what we found was that um, this, yes, the C over A ratio has an effect, Additions of things like titania um, has an effect also on mold powder crystallinity, and so that will have an effect on the heat transfer, potential surface quality issues. But zirconia doesn't, doesn't seem to have a massive effect. And that was uh, quite an interesting, because um, zirconia has, has always been thought of a, a, as quite a negative addition to mold powders um, and, and can cause some problems uh, further downstream. So things like SEN erosion, where you get bits of zirconia uh, becoming dislodged um, can cause problems, but but this this study seemed to, to to think that maybe that those problems weren't quite as bad as previously thought. Additions of things like B two O three again they they changed the, the mold powder behaviour, um, and maybe a high B two O three content is good, but then you run into problems with pickup of boron. So having gone through one set of investigations, we're sort of we, we've opened as many questions uh, as we answered, which uh, again is, is not necessarily a bad thing. In terms of future investigations in this area, um, some, some, here's some, a really nice uh, mold powder selection diagram that I think would be really great to update. So this was some work that was done, I think, from the Japanese steel industry about 30 years ago. I think it'd be really nice to update that so that steel makers could choose the mold powder depending on the carbon composition, the casting speed, the geometry, and make sure that you really do choose the right mold powder for your particular application. And finally, some work that we did uh, again a few years back looking at nozzle clogging, again, trying to look at uh, the effect of zirconia and sulfur on uh, the, the likelihood of, uh, of, of nozzle clogging, which will have an effect on uh, your productivity and surface quality. So we looked at uh, used SEN and, and quantified the, the various um, uh, buildups that we found on the SEM. We carried out some simple um, um, refractory dip tests, rotating dip tests. And we looked at the effect of percent sulfur in this case on the composition of the buildups that you got on that SEM and tried to end up with a sort of overall clogging tendency, a prediction of whether you're likely to get nozzle clogging as a function of the composition of your steel. Uh, and again, that work was uh, raised, raised some quite interesting questions and uh, led us into some fairly uh, obvious uh, avenues for further work.
Just to finish off with some downstream steel research topics, thanks to Mark Rainforth, who's been working uh, for a long, long time on development of, of advanced high strength steels. Um, he's done some wonderful work recently looking at nano precipitation steels. Um, so the idea is that uh, steels in automotive, we need uh, high tensile strength, good formability, good fatigue strength, as, good, as well as good weldability. Um, so we're not asking much there, are we really? Um, so what Mark and his team have done over the past five or six years or so is to design some of these very sophisticated uh, nano precipitation steels where um, we have some, uh, some excellent mechanical properties. And given the fact that some of the, the, the requirements are, are, are very, very strict. So in this case, for, for steels in automotive, we want high, high elongation. We also want a high hole expansion ratio. So the idea of the expansion ratio gives you an idea of the sort of formability of, of the steel. Usually they're mutually exclusive. So it's quite difficult to find a sort of baseline to start off with. Um, so Mark and his team decided that a single phase ferrite microstructure would be a good place to start. And then by, by looking at things like um, uh, precipitation of, of these very, very fine vanadium carbides, um, gives a, a very significant uh, contribution to an increase in strength. So you can see from the diagram on the right hand side, the contribution of things like grain size, but also precipitation uh, for a number of the different steels uh, that they looked at. And of course, the effect of process route on, the, on those properties too. Mark's also recently done some really nice work looking at copper. We've already seen how copper can be uh, quite a negative effect in steel. But what Mark has, 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 has done is tried to design a steel that can be produced through existing plant, but also make use of the fact that we know that copper increases the strength. In fact, it's used in a number of, of steel grades uh, as, as, as a way to increase the strength. So can we use that um, to, our, to our benefit and uh, sort of eliminate the, the, the difficulties of using copper? So again, some really nice work looking at trying to control the precipitation of copper. So that instead of precipitating at the grain boundaries, you get inside the grains, precipitation inside the grains. And they pin grain boundaries, so you get the very, very fine grain size. But they don't tend to have a major effect on the movement and dislocation. So we end up with this very nice small grain size, but also high ductility. And some lovely work they've done uh, from a recent publication in Nature, uh, I think it was in March this year, looking at this, uh, this true nano structure um, submicron grain size with a very, very high density of these very, very small copper precipitates. You can see some beautiful atom probe imaging uh, on this particular slide. But what does that do to the mechanical properties? Well, on the right left hand side, we've got the uh, different compositions and different heat treatments, different process parameters. On the right hand side, how it compares to some of those existing steels uh, that are classed as advanced high strength steels. So how it compares against the mar aging, mar aging steels and the uh, quenched partition steels. Uh, and you can see some, some incredible properties, 70% elongation and around about 800 yield strength. And finally, some work that he's done on looking at hydrogen embrittlement, uh, we know can be a problem, can lead to, to major failure of components in service. Uh, but can we design microstructural features that trap hydrogen and therefore uh, reduce the, the harmful effects of hydrogen. And this work again on vanadium carbides and some really nice work looking at um, actual imaging of hydrogen trapping inside these carbide particles. Again, using uh, very sophisticated techniques and really nice atom probe work here. You can see the deuterium trapped inside the vanadium carbide um, um, precipitates. So some really nice work based uh, uh, on, on the work that's uh, trying to understand more about hydrogen metals and how you can limit, eliminate the, the problem of hydrogen in steels. And finally, some work on looking at platinum group metals, precious metals as, as coatings for some steels. So rather than uh, a bulk coating, which would be incredibly costly, um, can we use a sort of functionally graded coating? Um, there's not a huge amount of work out there. So what we're doing is we're using spark platter sintering, sometimes known as field assisted sintering, to consolidate the powder that is doped with our precious metals 
and hopefully produce a, a, a graded microstructure, a graded composition that has the benefits of corrosion protection without necessarily incurring some of the massive expense. So you put your powder inside this machine, you squeeze the machine, you, sorry, you squeeze the powder, you pass uh, a pulsed DC through and you get sintering and consolidation at fairly low temperatures. Um, and so we're just starting this project and we're, we're looking at different dopants, palladium and ruthenium uh, for different stainless steels, um, 316 and 174 pH. See if we can produce these functioning graded metals, uh, which have these potentially really nice benefits. And finally, just to finish off, some other areas of work that I didn't have time to talk about. We've looked at niobium, effective niobium on high carbon steels. We've looked at the behavior of steels in fire. We've looked at biomass evaluation with my colleagues in the biology department to try and uh, understand about how we might grow biomass that could be used uh, in steel making operations. And then I just thought I'd finish with some, 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 some thoughts about potential collaboration. We are working together at the moment, but um, just to bring you up to speed with some of the developments in metallurgy at, at Sheffield, we've got our doctoral training system. I know you've got uh, uh, doctoral uh, training uh, centres at Warwick as well. This is the Advanced Metallic, metallic Systems uh, in conjunction with Manchester and with um, UCD and DCU in Ireland. Um, working very closely with a number of, uh, of, of industrial uh, partners. And the focus for this particular school is the digital technologies training. So maybe looking at some of the, the, the challenges around uh, artificial intelligence and uh, digital data management uh, that are becoming so prevalent. And finally, Royce at Sheffield, uh, the Henry Royce Institute is the uh, sort of UK's um, materials science research flagship. Um, we have a number of uh, satellites, but it's based out of Manchester, but there's a number of satellites around the UK. Uh, and Sheffield is, is uh, part of the advanced metals processing theme. So we've got a number of different facilities, a number of nice new buildings opened, which we're very glad to show you around next time you come to Sheffield. The Royce Discovery Center, which is uh, in the heart of the city, and the Royce Translational Center, which is out on the Advanced Manufacturing Parkway. And some of the equipment there, we've got um, induction melters, we've got powder production capability, including an atomizer. We've got our consolidation manufacturing capabilities, and we've also got some uh, um, uh, fast, and we've even got a nice new rolling mill as well, um, that uh, my colleague Eric Palmier is uh, doing some really nice work on. So, thanks for listening to this. Um, just to summarise and a quick look to the future, if I could, for the last two slides or so. I've given a, a wide range of a number of recent projects. The majority of those have been working alongside industry. And we've tried to maintain a focus on industrially relevant research. Sometimes, personally, I, 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 it's easy for me to lose sight of this. So coming back to this idea of, of, of listening to industry and understanding what their needs are, but also at the same time carrying out some some robust science uh, is a really nice balance uh, as far as we're concerned. And I think collaboration amongst the steel community will be, be absolutely key moving forward. There's some excellent examples of collaboration of this already, not just with Sustain, uh, but I think it's, it's a key way in, in which we can solve some of the problems as, as a community uh, rather than necessarily working in silos. And what might those opportunities be? Well, Hydrogen-based iron making, steel making is something that uh, everyone is looking at at the moment. Um, there are some benefits to it, but there are some key technological challenges around the use of hydrogen in iron and steel making. Um, going back to this idea of, of, of linking between cast products and casting parameters, there are still so many questions to answer and therefore so many potential research projects to carry out. Reuse and recovery. Again, is a, is a key theme, raw materials, low cost raw materials, making more efficient use of our raw materials is something that's at the heart of a lot of what we're doing. And this idea of machine learning, data analytics, again, is now 
Thank you very much for listening. And there is my email address if you'd like to get in touch. Thank you, Richard. Thank, thanks ever so much, Richard. You covered a, an awful lot of ground there. It was really nice. And it's nice to see that breadth really in what's going on. I have one question, technical question that I was just intrigued by. Um, that I wanted to ask, and that was when you were talking about the inclusions through thickness in the big blue. That you talked about the size of inclusions, which which I under, understood. One of the you made a comment there that the inclusions towards the center of the bloom were more elongated. I was just wondering if you, you know, what was the reason for it for them being elongated. Uh, that's a good question, Claire, and I, d I don't honestly have an answer to that. Um, mm. it, it may well. I can only think it, it must be influenced somehow by the by the by the by the localized solidification conditions that you might get there. Um, but I, I don't know necessarily why they would be elongated. And also, I don't know whether that was um, all of the inclusions we looked at or whether it was just a proportion and, and a particular chemistry of inclusion. So I think, as, as always in these cases, there are there's so much else that we could have looked at. Um, but I can only imagine it's, it's been influenced somehow by, by those local conditions that you get towards the centre of, uh, of the bloom. I didn't know whether it was if it was very much just at the centre, whether it was a, an influence of soft reduction um, and how much soft reduction would be used. Actually, I don't tend to look at bloom very much. It's no, in no. strip. Um, so don't, don't, it, was, it was an interesting one that I, I couldn't quite answer myself. And no, then, I think I, I, as, as, as you know, these 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 investigations, they, they tend to throw up more unknowns. Um, <sighs> It may well be that that I mean I, I think there's there's the knowledge and the link between dynamic soft reduction is is again one of these things that has been investigated but 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 still there are many many questions to ask and there's still gaps in the knowledge I think um, so so yeah it, it may well be it may well be I don't know how much soft reduction was put onto that bloom um, it'd be quite interesting to find out actually. Um, but yeah, I, that, that, that for sure would, would have had an effect. Um, but I think it would be interesting to know whether that affected all of the inclusions or just a certain proportion of those. Um, I think that then comes back to, you know, some of the fundamental data that we still probably need and, and getting better, getting, but, you know, high temperature hardness testing or, or deformation to, to get the true properties, high temperature properties of the different inclusions. Because you're absolutely right. Different inclusions will behave differently. Um, because because of their inherent mechanical properties, and um, yeah. I think that we are. Yeah, it's it's amazing how much more knowledge we have now than we had you know, ten years ago, and it'll be the same in ten years' time. Um, and, and that kind of leads me on to my my second question, really. And that's I, you know, you've highlighted some things that I think will be so important in terms of the future, and that's you know, some of the, the modelling work that's being done, the artificial intelligent work that's being done. And perhaps it would be um, to me comment on from your perspective, because you know the industry so well, you've worked with the industry for, for a long time, is how ready is the industry to take on board some of the really rapid developments in, for example, IA capability? Um, and how do we as an academic community support that translation into being able to benefit from some of these um, approaches that are, are being developed? Yeah, again, that's a really good question, Claire. Um, I think the industry is more ready and more um, amenable to this type of research than it has been in recent years. I think that the industry can see the benefits of some of these approaches. Um, particularly as they've been applied in other industries. I think it's, it's, it's always a case of uh, if, one, one, if one industry is a pioneer and can show some of the, uh, you know, the benefits of this type of approach, then other industries will follow. Um, I think the industry doesn't really know what its capabilities are. It is sat on so much data. Um, and there are so many areas that you could potentially apply it to that I think it's identifying what those priority areas might be. Um, it's going to be impossible to do everything, but I think 
a slow, steady approach where you take one aspect, you know, let's take the example of, of, of continuous casting, you know, some of the work that, um, that Michael's doing or, or Michael Aaron is doing or secondary steelmaking. If you can show the benefits within a fairly niche um, part of the process route, then it makes the, the take up of that uh, approach a lot easier to sell to the rest of the industry. But I think, I don't think the, the steel industry as a whole really knows what, what is possible with this particular type of approach. Um, and yeah, it, it, it's, it's, I, I know there's a, there's, there's a couple of sort of uh, made smarter and digital factory type uh, um, um, centers being launched over the past uh, few months or so. I think they will be key. Um, taking the, the, the best practice from other industries, bringing in other people, bringing in people from different disciplines to help and work with the steel industry. But I think it, it, there has to be a breakthrough somewhere um, before there's, there's a universal acceptance. And I think, it's, as always, it's, it's just demonstrating what the potential might be. Once there are some of those case studies in the market, it should be easier to sell it for the rest of the industry. But it's not going to be easy for sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, I agree. I do agree. Uh, Michael, you still have a question? Um, well, thanks a lot. Uh, Claire already asked the question, so I can only say that that's an interesting topic regarding the AI. Uh, I might come back to you, Richard, on that separately. Um, but I, I absolutely agree with what you said. Um, there is a lot of data out there that we have uh, collected, um, but haven't been hasn't been analysed properly. <clears throat> so. Um, absolutely. I'm, I'm just wondering um, whether we are at a stage where we need to scrutinize the data that has been correct, uh, collected for correctness, or if we can actually use that data ready for predictive modeling, uh, in addition to, to pure thermochemistry simulations, for instance. Yeah, again, that's a really good point, and I guess that's that's another sort of step in the process, isn't it, is to analyze the robustness of that data otherwise you know you, you we will end up going down a, a, a very long road but not have a huge amount of confidence mm -hmm. in the predictive capability at the end um so it's almost like a feasibility study of a feasibility study isn't it in some cases <laughs> yeah. um, but you know it, it's it, it, i think one of the tricky questions is where to start you know there is there is so much but where to start i think is a key but on uh, balancing on uh, on the other hand we have to start somewhere and i think some of the work that you're doing some of the work that these made smarter uh, centers will do where the idea is to work very very closely with industry in a way that maybe hasn't quite been done before these are, are going to be really really key in taking that forward but you, you, you're right um you know, if it, it may well turn out that that this huge amount of data that I'm thinking is out there, we can only use a very small proportion of it. But even so, that might be enough to really help us in in a number of different areas. So yeah, you, you're right. It's um, there there are many challenges ahead, but um, you know, I think I, I think you can see some of these small gains and how they might add up to a very, very big game if you put them all together. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Joseph, so, please. Uh, hi. Um, hi, Richard. This is Zushu. Hi, Zushu. Basically, I wanted to say um, we know nearly 20 years. I know your research and you know my what I'm doing. But I think this is very bold uh, overview. So it's a uh, it's a wonderful wonderful research uh, um, uh, presentation. Thank you so much uh, uh, for, for this. I think I only have a very quick question. It's about um, in one of the slides you talk about when you add like alloys or ferro alloys to the automotive steels, and you add nine. Uh, those nine are different steel grids. I think probably different steel grids. One of them, um, uh, the carbon dioxide emission is the highest, is 0 0.31. Uh, if I remember correctly, uh, that one is zero. So what is that particular steel grid? What kind of alloys you added? I don't know, probably too detailed. I don't know. Yet. No, no, no. I, well, 
what I, I had to, what I had to do is I had to take the the actual steel grades off because this this is work yeah, that, yeah. that's still confidential with Tata. Yeah. Um, but yes, they are different steel grades. Um, they are all automotive type grades. So some of the DP six hundred, DP eight hundred, interstitial free, boron steels, so on and so on. Um, so yes, we did we did look at those eight different grades, and and yes, some some of the some of the, 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 the there was a, a much more large effect on um, of alloying additions on CO2 emissions that we that we thought based upon the the, the individual recipe of, of, of steel making. So that was quite surprising. So, so that's like that highest one, three point one. Uh, that one is actually it because the, uh, because of the highest uh, uh, ferro alloy addition. That that is pretty much correct. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if we say if we uh, make like a mid, uh, medium magnetism or high magnetism, that means we will significantly increase the carbon dioxide emission. Is, is that sort of conclusion? That's the sort of conclusion, yeah. So one of the reasons we, we, we had to do this work was because um, there was no existing data on, on, on ferro alloy production. Okay. So we almost went back to basics. And tried to generate that data ourselves. And we looked at 10 different ferro alloys, ranging from the ferro niobium, the ferro vanadium, ferro titanium, all the way to silicon manganese, manganese, and so on. And we looked at the ways in which you'd make those alloys, and we tried to put um, an impact factor, if you like, to those ferro mm -hmm. alloys that mm -hmm. we then feed into to the steel making recipe. And you come out with um, uh, an overall figure of, of the effect of alloying additions on, on, on your process. So yeah, and um, to, to answer your question, uh, it, 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 it varies very much with, with the type of the type and amount of ferro alloy that you add. Oh, OK, OK, so you thank could, you. you. You could potentially see a way in which you could reduce your amount by changing the ferro alloys. But of course, you still need to meet your target properties. So um, again, it's, 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 it's part of an ongoing research project where more questions were opened than, than we answered. Um, but, but still quite interesting results anyway. And what we're doing now is we're, we're sort of looking at the robustness of that ferro alloy data and trying mm -hmm. to make sure that, um, you know, they are at least as accurate as the, the other LCA impact, uh, input data that we, we use in these particular situations. OK, thank you. Th thank you for your wonderful uh, presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Sushi. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, Sarma, uh, no? Okay. Uh, uh, hi, hi Richard, yeah. thank you for the presentation. Um, you looked at blooms and the structures within along with the finishing. Would you expect the same properties for slabs and billets as well? Um, it's a good question. Um, potentially, yes. But I, but I, th I think it, it needs investigation. Um, we, we didn't see a huge, so we, we did some, um, we did some Glebal testing on, 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 on the balloon specimens to look at the effect of deformation. Uh, that's something that we, we need to probably optimize. And, uh, you know, we, we learned a lot about, uh, about the, 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 the relevance of using Glebal tests in this situation. Um, but whether you'd have the same for slabs and billets, I think you might have something different for billet. Um, and obviously it depends how thin or thick slab you're talking about. So I, I think there will be there will be differences, um, particularly in in very, very thin slabs. I think you might find a difference, a significant difference in the inclusion population there. Um, for billets, if you're talking about round billets, again, you might have an effect on round billets. Um, so yeah, I, I, th I think you might see some significant differences depending on your on your cast geometry. Okay, Sounds brilliant. Like thank you. Sounds like an interesting project. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any any further question, Richard? I think uh, we probably then uh, end. Claire, you want to say anything uh, or? Thanks. Thanks very much. Well, I, I, to, to say thank you, you can tell 
Richard, that it was very interesting because, you know, people have stayed and had quite a few questions. And I, and I think that's um, because, you know, you're, you're speaking to a group that are very passionate about steel and you, and you talk passionately about what we can achieve with steel. So that is absolutely fantastic. But also it's uh, about...